evening, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology webinar hosted by Texas Instruments. Where tonight we're going to use photos, videos, and TI Technology to connect mathematics with the world around us. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI Technology to make tough to teach, tough to learn concepts accessible to all my students. Tonight, I'm really excited to be joined by Ron Lancaster. Ron is an associate professor at the University of Toronto, where he teaches mathematics courses for pre-service, middle, and high school teachers. Ron's professional activities include consultations and conference presentations around the world. He is the recipient of the 2015 Margaret Sinclair Memorial Award, recognizing innovation and excellence in mathematics education, which is awarded by the Fields Institute. Ron, it's so great to have you with us tonight. Hey, thanks a lot, Michael. Looking forward to it. We're expecting a large crowd tonight, so your audio is muted. Feel free anytime to say questions to Ron using the Q&A window on the right side of your screen. We'll also be using the chat window to send general messages. As a reminder, the session is being recorded and we'll find a link to the event certificate of attendance at the conclusion of the event. We'll also be sending a link for the documents that Ron's using tonight, also at the conclusion of the event. We hope you don't have any audio issues, but in the event that you do, try selecting communicate from the very top of the WebEx menu and choose audio broadcast. Our agenda tonight, we're really already working through some of those welcome and introductions. And tonight, we're really going to be focusing on connecting mathematics with the real world around you. We hope you stick around to the end because if you do, uh, you could be selected. Uh, we're one lucky winner tonight is going to be receiving a TQ Summer Workshop uh, registration. So please stick around to the end. We'll be announcing the winner uh, at the end of the webinar tonight. Ron, I'm giving you control. Feel free to share your screen. Okay, Michael, thank you. I'm just getting here organized here with the sharing. Um, Michael, can you see uh, the screen now? Yep, looks like the uh, title slide. Uh, fantastic, that's great. Hey, look, welcome everybody. I'm looking forward to doing this with all of you. Um, this is a little bit unusual for me. Usually when I work with teachers, I get a chance to actually, uh, you know, see people face to face. A uh, little bit about me, my email address is actually a true email address. Um, it's uh, Ron2718, and that's not because there were 2,717 uh, Rons ahead of me. It's because E begins with 2.718, so it's an email address. And my license plate is also very mathematical. I like to wear a math in my sleeve. Uh, my license plate in my Honda Civic is a DYDX. There's actually a bunch of uh, math teachers in Ontario that have mathematical license plates. Uh, if you know of anybody who has one, or if you have one, I'd love it if you could send me a picture, because I have a collection of these. One of the teachers here in Ontario, Fred Ferniohow, has a license plate that's actually better than mine. His is DYBYDX, so DY by DX. So he actually has the BY, which is kind of cool. Anyway, this is a picture of me so that you know what I look like. I wish I could see all of you. Uh, this picture was taken in Prague at the airport where there was a giant chess set, and I was enjoying myself there. So some takeaways for you tonight. Um, you know, the whole thing is going to revolve around using photos and videos. And my takeaway, one of my main takeaways here for you is just the idea of using these to, you know, introduce a topic to your students. Uh, or to provide students with an example of an application, you know, where, where math lives in the world around us. And um, I'm going to be developing math questions based on photos and videos and trying to model that. And, you know, my hope for all of you is that, you know, maybe you're already doing this and you'll get new ideas tonight. Uh, if not, maybe you'll embrace this idea and develop your own math questions around your own photos and your own videos. And then encourage your students to do this you know, to take their own photos and videos and develop their own math questions related to what's of interest to them. 
And, you know, all of this boils down to uh, these habits of mind. Annie Fetter talks about this a lot. You know, the idea of, of what do you notice and what are you wondering about and what questions do you have? So uh, these habit of minds, I think, are really important for, for all of us. And um, one of the takeaways also is, is, you know, just a response to this age-old question, <clears throat> you know, where students ask, when am I ever going to use this? Um, you know, many teachers are asked this. I, I've been asked this over the years as a teacher. And I think that, you know, part of the response is showing people where math lives and the applications of math. But I think it's deeper than that as well. Um, when students would ask me this question, it got me reflecting on the lesson. You know, was I engaging students? Uh, you know, was there something about the lesson that, uh, you know, I could have fixed or I could have improved upon? But I think part of the answer is showing students where math lives. And really, if we want to improve test scores, if kids don't care about the subject, I don't think it matters what we do. I mean, we're not going to improve test scores. They have to enjoy the subject and, and, and not see it as being a pointless exercise. So for me personally, I, I'm actually very uh, fortunate that I'm able to travel a lot. But everywhere I go, I put on a pair of mathematical glasses. And I love going for a walk. And, and I love cottywampling. Um, that may be a word that you've never seen before. But it, it means walking in a purposeful manner towards a vague, definite destination. And the purposeful manner is looking for the math. Um, that word, I first found out about it uh, in a newspaper article here in the city. There's a woman who has actually walked every street in the city I live in. And that's why I, where I first learned about the word cottywampling. In fact, I have a movie to recommend to you, The World Before Your Feet. Um, this is about a guy named Matt Green who actually walked on every block of every borough in New York City. And it's a great documentary, so you'll have to catch it. But, you know, walking is such a great thing to do. I mean, maybe you could take your students out for a walk and slow down, you know, and just stop and look at things, be curious, and then ask those questions. You know, what do you notice? What are you wondering about? And what questions do you have? So that's what we're going to model tonight. So one of my favorite walks um, that I've done actually a couple of times now is in Manhattan. And I started at West 72nd Street and walked all the way to West 215th Street. Um, each time it's taken me about five hours to do this walk because I've just meandered all over the place. But in this case, I actually had a purpose. There was a reason why I was going to West 250th Street. And it's because there's actually a street there called the West 215th Step Street. You may never have seen this term before, uh, but there are things called step streets. They're not your usual street. You know, you can drive a car along. So you're looking at the West 215th Step Street. Um, anyway, I had heard about this step street, and I just had to go there. So I went there. I was armed with a protractor, and I had tape measures. And um, you're going to see why I went there, because it turns out that when you get up to the 11th step, there's actually a little indication there of how high you are from ground level. So you're 6.3 feet above ground level at that stage. So after 11 steps. The really cool thing is that when you go all the way up to the whole thing, to the very top, to 110 steps, every multiple 11 it actually gives you the height above ground level. And if you're teaching um, patterns and linear functions and linear data, um, this is something that you might want to end up using uh, with your students um, because it's perfect. There are some pictures that I took of me actually uh, modeling this. So um, anyway, um, what I wanted to show you here for a moment uh, is an Inspire file. Because one of the nice things about Inspire is that you can put a picture into Inspire. And so, you know, I actually had a protractor with me that I was able to measure the slope of the steps, the slope of the handrail. Um, this picture in Inspire, I found it to be a bit dark. And uh, unfortunately, in Inspire, you can't change the opacity. You can't lighten up the picture. 
So I went to Photoshop and I actually lightened it up. And then I put in some uh, constructions. I added in some line segments. And one of the beautiful things in Inspire is that you can actually calculate an angle. So you can measure this angle here and find that it's about 28.9 degrees. And with my protractor and with an app on my iPad, I actually found that it was around 30 degrees. So, um, so that's something that you might want to end up doing um, with your students uh, with these steps is having them analyze it. Um, so let's go to Dallas. If any of you have ever been to Dallas, you may have seen this city hall. This is an outrageous building that leans actually at a 34 degree angle. That's just crazy. Um, so it's leaning way out. The angle of the face of, between the face of the building and the perpendicular is actually 34 degrees. That's, you know, that's what you see when you're standing in front of it. The picture on the right shows you the angle there and it's just crazy. So uh, that's a, a architectural drawing of it. Um, so you can see right here that it's got a three and a two here. So if you're teaching slope, maybe you could use this picture as a way of introducing students to the idea of slope. Um, because the slope of the face of the building is three divided by two. Uh, if you're teaching trigonometry, um, you could ask your students, you know, how would you work out the angle between the face of the building and the horizontal? And of course that's 10 inverse. Uh, three over two, uh, which comes out to be, I think it's around 56.3 degrees uh, for that. So this building here is it's just kind of waiting for you uh, to use for a number of uh, topics. Um, this is some information about the building itself. So um, there I mentioned the 34 degree lean there. But the really cool thing is that the width of the bottom floor, the first floor, is 126 feet. And when you go from the first floor to the second floor, the width goes up by nine and a half feet, by 9.5 feet. And this happens uh, with every floor. When you go from the fifth floor to the sixth floor, there's an increase of 9.5 feet. And there's, um, nine, there's eight floors altogether. So, um, so this is gonna be another example of a linear pattern, uh, linear functions and all of that. So this is a diagram here that, that shows you what's going on. There's the 34 degree angle right here. And the 56 degrees is the angle between the face and the ground level. And there's your 9.5 feet. You know, something you might want to ask your students is, which came first? Did IMP decide to make the angle 34 degrees? And then the 9.5 feet came along as a result of that choice? Or did IMP, the architect, decide to do 9.5 feet? So he wanted the width of every floor to go up by 9.5, and then he calculated the angle. You know, because these aren't independent uh, entities here. The 9.5 and the 34, they're connected to each other. So once you choose the angle, the 9.5 is determined. Um, you know, whatever, if, if you use 50 degrees, then 9.5 would be determined by that. So that's a nice question to ask your uh, students about that. So, um, so what you could do here is ask your students to uh, make a graph here. So you could let X represent the floor number. Um, you could let the width of the X floor be represented by Y um, and have them read the information or look up information about the building online and then complete the chart and get the data. And, um, and you can see here how you're adding 9.5 each time. So um, the sixth floor is 126 plus five times 9.5. So you end up having that. And, uh, and your students could plot this. So here's a nice question for your students. When you plot these eight points, is it okay to draw a line through the eight points? Like, is this discrete data or is it continuous data? Now, some of you might argue and say, well, no, there's, you know, there's no floor that's like the two and a half floor. You know, there's not a floor between the second and third floor. So some of you may argue that this is discrete data and you should not 
you know, draw a line between the points and make it continuous. Others of you might argue that it's actually okay because, you know, you could go, uh, you know, two floors up and then go half a floor up and you could look at the width of that. So, you know, anyway, it's a nice question to ask students whether it's continuous data or whether it's discrete data. Um, you could also ask students to find a mathematical model um, for the width of the X floor, which we'd let Y be that, as a function of the floor number, which is X. So to develop an equation for this. It's been interesting the changes in my teaching. In the in my earlier years of teaching, this question, I would have worded it by saying, um, find a linear equation that fits this, blah, 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 blah. I would have actually specified what model to use. You know, it would have been over scaffolded. But today, you know, we're trying to get away from that and actually having us uh, ask students to, you know, and not telegraphing to students what the model is. So they have to figure out what model would be appropriate uh, to do that. And so there's our equation there. Um, you know, it's going to be 126 uh, plus 9.5 uh, times x minus 1. We can also ask students to simplify that, you know, to write it in standard form, uh, y equals mx plus b, or in this case, b plus mx. But, you know, the question for all of us is, like, why would we ask that question? Why would we ask them to simplify it and to write it in this form? Historically, our curriculum was really heavily involved in having students go from one form to another. There was a lot of these algebraic manipulations. And I think one of the things that was missing is there was never a conversation about why we were doing it. Like, what was the purpose of going from one form to another? Um, so I think in this question here, this case, it's a good question for us to ask. Like, why would we ask our students to do this? Um, the original form, the 126 plus 9.5 times x minus 1 is beautiful. I mean, it speaks to us. You can see the 126. That's the length of the first floor. The 9.5 is how much it's going up by. You destroy that when you simplify it. It's gone. Now you got 116.5. You know, what is that? Um, on the other hand, simplifying it does put it in a form where you see the slope easier and the y-intercept. So, or you might want to just, um, you know, give the students to this question just to practice. But, but I think it's a question we need to ask. Like, why are, why, why are we having students go from one form to another? Uh, you know, what is the purpose of that? Um, so I think that's a good question. So here's another uh, question for your students. So I am Pay set this up with a 34 degree angle. So the face of the building, the angle between the face of the building and the perpendicular is 34 degrees. And each floor, the width of each floor goes up by 9.5 feet. So what would happen if I am pay use 33 degrees or 35 degrees or 40 degrees or 50 degrees or 10 degrees? How would everything change? Uh, so what would happen? And what you might want to do is build a model in Inspire that's dynamic, where you could actually move um, the building so that you could increase the angle or decrease the angle. So that's something that you could do. But uh, it's a nice question here where we're, where we're playing with the original data. Um, so this is the diagram. If you're going to ask your students this question, the fundamental thing that they're going to need to do, if, if they want to change this angle from 34 degrees to 33 degrees and figure out what the new 9.5 feet is, the fundamental thing that they need to know is the height of each floor. They have to be able to find that. Um, and again, I think today we're trying to get away from telling students that. Like we could over scaffold this by, you know, having a part A where it tells students to find the height of the building, height of each floor rather. But um, maybe it's better just to let students kind of figure out what they need to know. So, um, so this is going to be the, you know, the, the general case. So instead of 33 degrees or 35 degrees, let's let it be theta. And we'll work out an equation. 
uh, for the width of the X floor. And again, this business here with the assumption, I put it in red here because you might not want to have that there. You might want to let students, you know, figure out what assumptions they're going to make and don't tell them. You know, again, we can over tell with things in our teaching. So, um, so here's the general case. So we're going to go from 34 degrees to theta, and we want to figure out what the 9.5 is. But the first thing we need to do is to figure out the height of each floor. So um, there's some basic right angle trigonometry. So it comes out to be 14.1 feet. That's the height of a floor. And uh, the assumptions I'm going to make here is that the 126 feet doesn't change. That's the width of the first floor. And the 14.1 feet doesn't change either. And what I'm interested in here is finding out if I make the 34 degrees theta, what's the 9.5 become, you know, as a function of theta and the floor number, you know, the X floor. Uh, by the way, when you look at the 14.1, uh, I've tried over the years to get students to look at answers and, 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 you know, to always ask themselves, am I having a James Brown moment? James Brown had this great song called I Feel Good. And uh, so what I'm trying to get students to do is to look at the answer and ask themselves, do I feel good about the answer? The 14.1 feet, does that seem okay? Um, you know, that actually looks kind of high. You know, if you compare the height of a classroom or the height maybe of your apartment or your house, the 14.1 does seem kind of high. On the other hand, this is a business building. So it's hard to say, but I, you know, I, I feel okay about the 14.1. If that answer was 60 feet, I wouldn't be feeling very good. I mean, how could the height of each floor be 60 feet? And if it was five feet, I wouldn't feel good either. This is actually really important to, for students to do because I'm sure we've all taught students who would mix this up right from the beginning. They would do H over 9.5 equals 1034 or 9.5 A over H equals 10 of 56. But at least by looking at the answer and asking yourself, do I feel good? Am I having a James Brown moment? At least it gives you an opportunity to, um, you know, to kind of have a check here. Like, how am I doing? Uh, with this. So anyway, the actual mathematical model uh, isn't that hard to get here. It's just some basic right angle trigonometry. Um, this is the generalized formula here. Um, so um, theta is the, you know, what 34 degrees was before, and that's the equation. Now, as you will know, in high school, uh, we don't normally have students make graphs where you have a function of two variables. Um, so one thing you could do here is you could just pick a floor. You could say, let's look at the eighth floor and let's look at the relationship between the width of the eighth floor and theta. So as you change the angle, how does the width of the eighth floor change? And then you have a function of one variable, you know, y in terms of theta. Um, so that's something that um, that you could do here. And, um, and the really nice thing is you can ask students how it changes. So what happens, you know, as you increase theta from, say, zero degrees, where it's straight up, to 90 degrees? Um, you know, what happens to the value of y um, uh, when you increase? Uh, this is using a TI-84. So I put the equation into the y equals k, set up the window, and there's the graph. And you'll see that it is incredibly sensitive when you get up at 70, 80, 85 degrees. Uh, you can just change theta just a little bit, and the width of the eighth floor just goes crazy. Uh, you know, it's very sensitive. But in the beginning, it's not very sensitive. Um, you might want to use this when you're teaching calculus, because this is all about sensitivity. And, uh, you know, and how y changes in terms of theta. Or you could just use it when you're teaching right angle trigonometry and you're doing that. So, um, so that's the graph of y versus theta. Now, maybe this is a silly question here, but, you know, you could also ask, is it possible to find an angle? So this is the angle between the 
face of the building in the perpendicular, for which the width of the eighth floor is like a thousand feet. You know, that's like five times what it actually is now. I mean, the deeper question is, could you actually build it? You know, and why or why not? And so you have this equation here uh, to solve, um, to do this. So, um, so that's something that you could do uh, with this. By the way, in solving this equation, you can do it analytically, of course, but you can also use uh, the uh, TID3, TID4 rather, um, and you could use the solver. Um, you know, you could open up the solver and um, you could put in uh, Y1, uh, Y1 minus 1,000, that's the equation you're trying to solve, and um, you could uh, solve it and do that. By the way, just a reminder, when you use the solver, you always have to make sure that you press alpha enter uh, because 115 isn't the solution. That's just the last value uh, of x. So, um, so the TID4 is actually pretty good for solving this. Um, you could use graphs. You could graph y equals 1,000, and you could look at the two graphs and find the intersection point, or you could use the solver, as I just mentioned. Um, but as I said earlier, the deeper question is, could you actually do it? Could you build it? I mean, that would be just an insane lean, you know, the 82 degrees. How, how would you make it stand up, uh, you know, overall? So anyway, we've gone from New York uh, to Dallas. So let's go to San Francisco. Um, by the way, if you've never heard this song after the webinar, go to YouTube and type in, let's go to San Francisco. Uh, my guess is that most of you, maybe all of you, have never heard this song. It was by a group called the Flower Pot Men, and it's it's got a great beat to it. So uh, you can take a look at that afterwards. But anyway, let's go to San Francisco and let's see what math we can find there. So this is the Trans America Building. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite buildings uh, in San Francisco. A remarkable building. Um, this was actually um, very interesting, the design of the building. People often look at it and they wonder, why would you do that? Like, why would you design a building like that? Um, well, the story that I've heard and that I've read is that the architect was actually trying to build this to minimize the shadow on other buildings. So they were actually trying to be friendly to the neighbors. Um, I've often wished that I could go up to the top of this building, uh, but unfortunately, the uh, 48th floor, where you have incredible views of San Francisco, is no longer open to the general public. Uh, you have to work in the building uh, to get in there. So I've never had a chance to actually uh, get up into that area. The architect was uh, William Pereira. Uh, he designed hundreds of buildings around the US. And if you've ever been out at the Los Angeles airport, he actually designed the flying saucer at the airport. Uh, it's called the theme building. So uh, that was one of his buildings. And he also designed the Geisel Library at UCSD. Um, amazing building. Um, this library is just crazy. I mean, this gives you an example of, you know, what this thing looks like. Um, it's called the Geisel Library because it's named after the author of Dr. Seuss. And there's a sculpture in front of the library uh, of him. Anyway, back to the building. So I'd like you to look at this building. I mean, if, if we were face to face right now, I would ask you to stop and to really look at the windows. You know, what do you notice? What are you wondering about? What questions do you have? I'm not going to do this here and stop the webinar for 10 minutes while you do this because that's not going to work. But with your students, do that. Just stop and just have them look at the windows and, and get into those habits of mind. Um, it turns out there's a really cool pattern. On the 48th floor, at the very top, right up here, there are actually eight windows. But when you go down to the 47th floor, there's still eight windows. And then the floor below that, there's nine windows and nine windows. And this goes 
all the way down the building. So you have a really interesting pattern here uh, between these. So you actually have, you know, a couple arithmetic sequences here um, as you go down. So it's really cool uh, the way this works. Um, by the way, this material uh, is actually from a column that I write for the NCTM. Maybe some of you have seen it. Uh, it was called uh, The Mathematical Lens. Um, there's a new journal coming out from the NCTM, and the mathematical lens is now gone. So the, the last issue will be next month. Um, but we've had over 100 columns. They're all archived. So you might want to go to the NCTM website. You'll need to be a member. And you can actually have all of the columns. And they all involve photographs and math questions. But um, this column was from November, December 2018. And it's a column that my co-editor, Bridget Bentley, and I uh, wrote together. And it's all about the windows and the building itself. So here are some questions that appeared um, in that article, in that column. So if this pattern continues, how many windows are there on the sixth floor? Or the 10th floor? Or the 50th or the, the 30th floor? And you know, how many windows are there on the nth floor? So developing an equation for this, a formula, where n is an integer between 1 and 48. Um, you're going to see that there's some really nice mathematics here. And um, students will have to figure out that they're going to need to do the evens separately and the odds separately because of the way the patterns work here. Um, calculate the total number of windows. So how many are in the building? And then you can actually look online and you'll find that it says that there's 3,678 windows. So you can compare your answer to 3,678. You know, how have you done um, with that? So, um, so with part A, um, there's your formula. It's actually a split function. So it's a piecewise defined function. So there's two different formulas, depending if n is even or if n is odd. Um, that will actually be um, a nice question for your students to develop. Uh, they're both linear equations here, um, but they're separated, you know, depending, as I say, whether n is even or whether it's odd. So um, I think this would be a nice question for you to give your students uh, a bit of a non-routine question uh, when they're studying linear functions. So here's another question about the total number of windows. Um, so this is going to involve summations. Um, so you could just, you know, make a spreadsheet and add it up, uh, but you could also um, have students use the summation formulas uh, as well. Um, so um, that's, you know, there's, there's a number of ways that you could do this here. Uh, by the way, the answer that you get when you add up the, um, the, the number of windows is actually going to be incorrect because it turns out the pattern doesn't go all the way down to the first floor. Uh, it only goes down to the sixth floor. The bottom five floors, it's, it's different down there. So, um, but again, when students don't get an answer of 3,678, now they need to think about why they didn't get the correct answer. You know, what's wrong here uh, in doing it? There are also some wings in the side of the building. You can see here, uh, these are actually for the elevator shafts. So there's less windows on these uh, sides of the building here. So, um, but it'll be a really nice question here for your students to get this answer and multiply by four. Um, by the way, it turns out that their answer is actually going to be somewhat close to the actual answer, but it's because there's a couple things going on. They've overcounted because of the base. There are no windows at the base, but they've undercounted because of the wings here. So uh, it's kind of cool the way that works out. Um, so, here's another question for you. So, this is some data that I found online. It turns out that if you look at the 48th floor, 
the width of that floor is 45 feet. And the width of the fifth floor is 145 feet. So can you develop a formula for the length of the side of the nth floor? So, you know, how big is the 30th floor? Can you come up with an equation for that? And now that you have an equation, can you find the area of the nth floor? Um, and then can you calculate, you know, the total area? So that will be all of the floor space in this building from the fifth floor to the 48th floor. So as you can imagine, there's going to be uh, summations involved here. Um, there's the formula there for um, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the side, the length of the side of the nth floor. So it's about minus 2.3n times plus 156.6. The, the slope is negative because it's going down, um, you know, there. So, um, so this will be a nice question for your students um, developing that equation. And then the area, of course, is just that squared. So it's S squared. That's the area. But now, the bigger question is, what's the total area? So you need to sum this from 5 to 48. N equals 5 to N equals 48. Uh, so there's going to be a summation involved. This is actually a nice place where the Inspire um, can be used quite nicely because um, what I did here is I just played a little bit with Inspire. So I took that formula uh, for the length of the side of the nth floor, and of course it's squared, and I just did the summation, and you know I came up with this answer, so about 435,000 square feet. So I did that. So that's one possibility uh, to do. Um, but I found it interesting to just just play. So I asked the Inspire to expand this. And, uh, and it gave me this answer here. It actually gave me this factored form. Um, and then I asked it to expand this factored form. And I ended up getting this. And um, the really cool thing here is that now students can look at this and they can realize that all they really need to do is figure out how to sum the squares, once five squared plus six squared plus seven squared up to 48 squared. Because this 10,000 divided by 1849 is just a number in front. You can multiply it by the end. And this end here tells you that you just need to add up five plus six plus seven plus eight up to 48. And this is a constant that just appears each time. So, um, so Inspire actually gives you a bit of a clue here of, of what you need to know how to do. And of course, the nice thing is that Inspire gives you the formulas um, that you need. I know that some teachers are kind of scared of using this because they're looking at this and thinking, gee, I don't know whether I want students using this or not. Um, you know, I'd rather have them work this out by hand or whatever. But um, this actually isn't so scary because what you could do at this stage is ask your students to find the formula for the sum of the of n cubed, and n to the fourth, and n to the fifth, and n to the sixth. And they can look at the pattern and the answers. You know, what do they notice? What are they wondering about? What questions do they have? So, um, so you can look at the patterns and the results um, of this. So there's lots of mathematics um, uh, in this building. Um, you know, you've got everything from the windows to the floor space. Uh, that you can do with this uh, overall. So anyway, let's take a trip to Seoul in South Korea. So this is a picture that I took a couple years ago. Uh, this is some sushi. Again, what I'm just trying to model for you is this idea of just slowing down and looking around, noticing things, wondering, and asking questions. You know, many people would have probably just walked past this, but I, I deliberately slow down. I'm always looking around at stuff and, and noticing things. So for me, you know, I noticed this and I wondered how many pieces of sushi are there? 
you know, so it's one plus two plus three up to six. So it's 21. And um, these were, of course, called triangular numbers. So the number 10 is a triangular number. It's one plus two plus three plus four. Um, by the way, the reason I've colored the six and the 28 is because they're both perfect numbers. And um, it turns out that perfect numbers always appear in triangular numbers in this list. The number six is called the perfect number because if you take all the factors of six, um, one, two, and three, not including six, if you add them up, you get six, one plus two plus three. The number 28 is perfect because if you take all the factors, not including 28, and add them up, you get 28. One plus two plus four plus seven plus 14. Uh, the reason I colored 36 is because that's a perfect square. Uh, so is one actually. Um, but a nice question for students is what is the next triangular number that's also a perfect square? You know, how would you work that out? And of course, there's a formula for this. Um, this is Gauss's formula, or it's the formula for the handshake problem. Uh, 1 plus 2 plus 3 up to n is n times n plus 1 uh, over 2. These triangular numbers actually have a lot of properties. So if you pick any two consecutive triangular numbers and add them up, you actually always get a perfect square. Try it. 21 plus 28, 49. 10 plus 15, 25. How would you prove that? You know, what would the mathematics be uh, to do that? So, um, again, I played around with Inspire here, and um, I just started to tinker here, and I asked Inspire to take, this is the sum of two consecutive triangular numbers, n times n plus 1 over 2, and n plus 1 times n plus 2 over 2, and um, I asked it to factor it. I guess I could have tried expanding just to see what would happen. And it gave me the n plus 1 squared. Um, now, you might prefer to have your students actually do this by hand. Because really, it's not that complicated. You factor out n plus 1, you do the math, and you get n plus 1 squared. But one of the nice things about Inspire is that you can ask students, what about the sum of three consecutive triangular numbers? You know, what about it? And you'll see here that it's 3n squared plus 9n plus 8 over 2, and that's not a perfect square. What about the sum of four consecutive triangular numbers? Is that a perfect square? Um, so you can actually have students play here and do this. So, you know, I agree with you. Maybe we should have students do this by hand. Uh, but this part here, well, we're not going to do that by hand. It's just way too complicated. But Inspire allows you to actually play with this and, um, and come up with some results. So um, anyway, that's the algebraic proof, you know, where you uh, factor out the n plus 1 and you end up with n plus 1 squared. So since we're in uh, Korea and South Korea and Seoul, uh, I'd like to introduce you to some candy in Seoul. So um, I'm just going to play a little video here for you. And um, you may not be able to hear this um, super well, but um, I'll just get this set up here. And uh, I just need to do a little bit of uh, work here just at the beginning. So this uh, video I took in Seoul, and here goes. Very good. Wow. Thank you. 
You might not have been able to see that very well or hear it, but it's actually amazing. And when I stood in front of this booth in downtown Seoul, uh, I was just blown away at seeing powers of two appearing in front of my eyes. So the next time you're teaching exponents and powers of two exponential functions, use this video. Uh, you can look up the candy online. It's called Dragon Beard Candy, and you can find your own video if you'd like. Uh, but a great question for your students is, when will there be a million strands? I mean, he had that that uh, piece of candy initially. It was like one piece, and then he folded it over and folded it over again and again and again and again and kept doubling each time. Um, but remarkable. So when will you have a million strands altogether? So essentially, it's 2 to the x, 2 to the power x equals a million. And of course, there's different ways of solving that. So um, I've got a couple things left for you. Um, I just wanted to give you another example of how I slow down and I notice things and I wonder about things and I ask questions. At the TQP International Conference this year in Baltimore, I stayed at the Baltimore Wariat uh, Waterfront Hotel. And when I walked into the bathroom, I almost fell over because that's what was in the bathroom. There was the soap from the Tan Soap Company, and it was in a pyramidal fresco, and I couldn't believe it. So I called down to the front office, talked to the hotel manager, his name was Zach, and I said, Zach, can you send me more soap? And uh, he wondered why. I said, I'm a math teacher. I want to do something with this soap. He came up, knocked on my door, brought me some soap, and this is what I made. And the fundamental question for your students is, if you had more of these boxes, could you make an n-gon, like a perfect n-gon uh, that would go around the ring? So could you do it? So he actually brought me about 20 boxes. He was an interesting guy because he said to me, I think you need more uh, than 20. So uh, anyway, he went back downstairs and brought me more. but. Um, you might want to use uh, Inspire for this because um, with Inspire, what I did is I put a picture uh, inside Inspire. I imported a picture in of the box. And then I actually made a shape here. And uh, of course, I was curious um, what the angle was. So I measured this angle here and discovered that it was 85.1 degrees. Hmm. I didn't have a protractor with me. So I thought, wow, 85 degrees. If it is exactly 85 degrees, that would mean this angle up here would be 10 degrees. And so I'd need 36 of these to make a perfect M gun. Hmm. So this Inspire file is actually set up for you to use because what you'll be able to do is to click on rotate and you'll be able to actually rotate the polygon by 10 degrees and you'll actually be able to see if it is 36. So, uh, so that's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is you could give students some paper to cut out. You could give them a model of this and they could cut it out and make a whole bunch of them and you know and arrange the paper and and see what happens when they do it. Uh, it turns out that it was 36. Uh, that's a picture of all of them on my bed in the hotel. Um, 36 beautiful boxes of it. So look, where does math live? That's the question I posed at the beginning. Well, it's everywhere. You just need to slow down. You just need to stop, be curious, notice things, wonder about things, and ask questions. And if you do this, you're just going to find mathematics everywhere. It's just all over the place. And really, this, this is really what I think all of us would want for our students, for them to be able to look at the world this way and just see mathematics everywhere and, and see the subject wherever they go. 
Anyway, I hope that you've enjoyed the webinar tonight. Um, this is a little bit odd for me because I usually work face to face with teachers. Uh, but I just wanted to tell you that I'm going to be at a number of conferences coming up. Uh, if you happen to be at any of these, please come up and say hello. Um, it would just be nice to meet you. Um, these are three conferences that uh, I just highly recommend to you. I'll be in New Orleans in early June at the Mathematical Sciences Institute. This is an amazing conference. It's a three-day conference. It's very personal. It's one of my favorite conferences. I've been there a number of times. And um, there's usually 50 or 60 teachers at the conference. You would have a great time. So it's, it's really for all teachers. And you could look up the conference and see if it would interest you. Um, at the end of June, I'll also be in Exeter, New Hampshire at uh, the Agnes Greer Conference. Uh, this is, I would say, the best conference on the planet for math teachers. Uh, in June, uh, it'll be a milestone for me. It will be my 31st year in a row at this conference. And the fact that I've gone 31 years in a row I think speaks volumes of how much I value this conference. So if you ever get a chance to go, go to the conference. It's a week long, it's math 24 seven, and it's amazing. Uh, there's still openings, so you know if you were free, you could go this June. There's also another favorite conference of mine that I love going to, and it's at the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics, and it's held usually near the end of January. So all three of these conferences, I highly recommend to you. I'll be at all three of them and maybe I'll see you there. Uh, there's also a number of other conferences I'll be at as well. If, if anybody out there is from Wisconsin, uh, I'll be at the uh, annual Math Council um, conference uh, in early May. Uh, if there are some teachers from Ontario, uh, I'll be up at our annual conference in Ottawa. Uh, I'll also be at a conference at MoMath, the Museum of Mathematics in August. Uh, it's a conference all in recreational mathematics. And uh, in late June, I'll also be at a conference on uh, computer algebra software. Um, so that'll actually be my first time there. And, uh, and then this fall, I'll be at an NCTM regional conference uh, in Boston. Um, that actually is going to be another milestone for me. I feel so fortunate that I've been able to get to a lot of conferences. Uh, but that conference in Boston will be my 60th. NCTM conference uh, between regional and annual conferences. Uh, it'll be number 60. And I see, feel so fortunate because these conferences have helped me become a better teacher. And they've also connected me to teachers all over the place. And uh, if anybody out there is from Asia, I'll also be doing some weekend workshops for international school teachers in uh, Shanghai and also in Osaka. And that'll be later on. But uh, I would love to meet you. Uh, it'd be just so nice to be able to see a face. Because as I said at the beginning, I don't have a chance to see you tonight. Anyway, thanks a million for taking this webinar. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. And I hope that there are some things that you'll be able to go and use uh, with your students. Uh, Michael, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thanks so much, Ron. Oh, you're very welcome, Michael. Take me just a moment here, um, stop sharing, and Michael, Perfect. back to you. Thank you. Uh, as we begin wrapping things up tonight, if you have any uh, last minute questions for Ron, uh, please try to get those asked. I know uh, we can try to get those answered in the, the few minutes we have remaining. Uh, one thing I do want to share, uh, available on our website, education.ti.com. Um, I noticed that for many of you, this is your first uh, T-Cubed professional development webinar. So uh, thanks so much for, for joining us tonight. Uh, we're excited to have you. Um, and if you're looking to learn more about uh, some of our webinars that we offer, under the professional development tab on our website, you can slide down to webinars in the middle. And you can check out uh, one or, or both. Uh, our live upcoming webinars, uh, which we're kind of winding down, winding down for the spring here. Uh, but you can see we already started posting some webinars uh, for uh, what I would consider to be our summer slash fall series, uh, which is going to pick up July 16th. So we take a few weeks off uh, once the school year kind of ends for a lot of schools and, and picks up back in the summer um, to get everyone ready for the fall. So 
Uh, please feel free to take a look through this list. And if there's anything that you think you might be interested in, feel free to register uh, by registering. Even if you can't attend live, you automatically get uh, a follow-up email that will say, hey, we noticed that you uh, attend this webinar or you missed this webinar, either one, but you still get links for the certificate, the documents, and also the recording for the webinar. So um, it's great to register, even if you uh, necessarily don't know if you're going to be able to attend live. Hey, Michael, I was trying to be cognizant of the time here, and I, I decided not to come back to you about any questions in the chat room. Uh, but was there anything that kind of jumped out at you that uh, in a moment or two you wanted me to uh, speak to? Um, I didn't see any uh, specifically. Uh, maybe I missed one, uh, but I, I don't think I saw any uh, that were asked. Uh, that's fine, Michael. Just thought I'd ask. We're excited to have uh, many T-Cube summer workshops uh, coming in and around uh, the United States. Um, you can learn more about them at our website, education.ti.com. Uh, um, they're really a great way to extend your learning over the summer, uh, whether it be a piece of technology or maybe some content. Uh, so please feel free to visit our website to learn more uh, about those T-Cube summer workshops. And also, we mentioned that uh, One Lucky Winter Time is going to receive a free uh, registration for a T-Cube Summer Workshop. And tonight's lucky winner is Landon Ellis. So Landon, congratulations. Uh, we'll be in touch over email in the next couple of days to give you a little more information. But we hope to see Landon as well as everyone else at a T-Cubed Summer Workshop. When you leave the webinar tonight, a brief survey will automatically appear in your browser. Your feedback guides us as we plan future online events, and we really hope you share your thoughts in the post-webinar survey. To receive a certificate of attendance, go ahead and click that link in the chat window. Also, this is link for the documents uh, from tonight, and you know Ron really did a superb job putting those documents together. Uh, so there's not only uh, the PowerPoint that he used, but also um, the files from the TI Inspire documents that he created. So please feel free to visit those links uh, to receive that certificate and also to get the documents for tonight. And if they happen to uh, causing you uh, any sort of issues or problems, don't worry, again, you'll automatically get a follow-up email like I mentioned. And in that follow-up email will be a link to the certificate, a link to the documents, and a link to the recording. And if you're watching this on demand, go ahead and copy that link into your favorite browser to receive your certificate. Lastly, if you're in need of any post-webinar follow-up or you have any questions, uh, feel free to give us a call at 1-800-TI-CARES or send us an email at ti-cares at ti.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much, Ron, for everything you shared tonight, uh, helping us to slow down and see the math uh, around us in the world. So thanks so much for everything. Well, thanks, Michael. Thanks for your help. Much appreciated. And be well to everybody. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us. We hope to see you back online real soon. Have a great night.